In the late 1970s, the Soviet Union started deploying its first fourth-generation combat aircraft. The Su-24M strike fighter joined the fleet in 1979 and was soon followed by the MiG-31 heavyweight interceptor, the MiG-29 medium-weight fighter, and the Su-27 flanker heavyweight air superiority fighter. The MiG-29 was among them and was built on the biggest scale, with the lowest operational expenses, and was primarily created with exportation in mind. Hundreds more were sold across the world, not just to communist nations like Cuba, North Korea, and East Germany, but also to neutral powers like Iraq, Iran, and India, even though the Soviet military had over 800 operational by the end of 1991. Even though the USSR had been willing to export its best fighters widely in the early years of the Cold War, the MiG-31 and Su-27 were never sold abroad due to program secrecy. Instead, the only heavyweight fighter interceptor exported was the older third-generation MiG-25 Foxbat, which was well-liked in India and the Arab world. Despite this strategy, the USSR did ship a limited number of Su-27s to a single customer just months before it collapsed after the Cold War ended. This export foreshadowed the flankers' rise to prominence as one of the most well-liked weapons systems in post-Soviet Russia on the global arms market. With a contract for 24 Su-27 fighters signed on the 28th of the month, China in December 1990 became the first nation ever permitted by the Soviet Union to purchase the aircraft. The MiG-29 and Su-24, which were made available to export clients worldwide, were marketed as the potential future backbone of China's fighter fleet, which at the time lagged behind the USSR and the United States in terms of technology. Discussions about the sale of fourth-generation Soviet fighters to China started in 1988. The most capable fighter in the Chinese inventory at the time was the J-7, a derivative of the MiG-21 that had joined the Soviet fleet in 1959 albeit with less advanced capabilities than the latest Soviet MiG-21 variants. Even this aircraft operated in only limited numbers in China, with the bulk of its fleet formed by derivatives of the aging MiG-19 that had first flown in 1952 and were barely considered a second-generation fighter. This meant that whichever fourth-generation aircraft China did acquire would represent a very significant technological leap, although Chinese negotiators nevertheless insisted on the Su-27 which had the longest range, greatest versatility, and was overall considered the most sophisticated. There have been many rumors about the Soviet justification for sanctioning Su-27 shipments to China. According to some stories, during negotiations, Soviet and Chinese officials who had studied in the USSR recalled years of close collaboration in the 1950s, which moved the former to support the sale of the Su-27 in principle. Another emphasized that the USSR gave in on the matter because of its geopolitical position and the need for collaboration with China. In contrast to customers like Egypt and Indonesia who had given the United States their most capable Soviet-built fighters in the 1970s, China's chances of compromising the Su-27's technologies to Moscow's potential adversaries remained slim after Beijing's relations with the West started to deteriorate in 1989. Some believe the sale was the beginning of greater cooperation and interoperability between the communist superpowers at the time. China was already considering license production agreements for Soviet fighters on its soil, which from Moscow's perspective could both strengthen a valuable partner and provide an essential source of funding for the Su-27 program. However, this cooperation was never realized because the Soviet Union disintegrated in December 1991, just after China received the only three Su-27 fighters it had ever exported. Russia then fulfilled the contract and concluded several additional flanker export agreements through the middle of the 2000s. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, the production of flankers was drastically reduced as a result of an almost complete cessation of orders from Soviet successor states, making the program incredibly dependent on Chinese funding. 
Even with a shared reliance on the Su-27, the state of the Russian Air Force in the 1990s meant there was little room for joint exercises or strengthening of cooperation in the field of fighter aviation other than in manufacturing and production. At the time, pilots' flying hours were below the bare minimum safety standards, much less sufficient to develop a meaningful combat capability. With features like stealth coatings, AESA radars, and high boresight air-to-air missiles among others, China would eventually become the most prominent user of the flanker and produce advanced derivatives of the Su-27 today thought to be in many ways more capable than those in the Russian Air Force. The Su-27 and its derivatives would be widely exported by Russia throughout the world, but China's ability to obtain Soviet approval for the purchase of the aircraft marked the start of what might have been a powerful security alliance had domestic politics in the USSR not deteriorated dramatically in the year that followed the contract signing. The Su-27 has been phased out of service by both China and Russia, the latter in favor of more recent flanker derivatives like the Su-35S and the former in favor of a variety of fighters, including fifth-generation J-20 stealth planes. In terms of fighter aircraft, China has caught up to the United States by the late 2010s, after falling behind by three decades in 1991. China's J-20, one of only two fifth-generation fighters currently being produced, was deployed alongside the F-35 in squadrons. Contrarily, the MiG-1.42, a promising fifth-generation program developed by the Soviet Union, was abandoned in the 1990s, and the Su-57, which was intended to replace it, has made slow progress due to the deterioration of the Russian economy and technology sector following the fall of the Soviet Union. The outcome has been a drastic role reversal between China and Russia, with the latter emerging as a leader in fifth-generation technologies far more quickly than expected while the former has lagged in fourth-generation technology for 40 years.